Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network. I'm here broadcasting from the East Coast of the United States, Long Island, New York. And as you know, I founded the Sales Pro Network to elevate the profession of sales. It's a place where you can come to share your challenges, get great coaching from people like today's guest, myself, as well as a lot of my personal competitors. Uh, you can share your successes and failures. And every Friday, we do a terrific interview with somebody who can add value to you people who either sell for a living or as part of their job. And uh, I, I, I always say I hate cliches, but I seem to use them a lot. So I guess I don't. And I repeat the same thing over and over. I could not be more excited to introduce you to today's guest. And I know I said the same exact thing last week, but today's guest is Steve Bookbinder. Um, I know Steve for many years. I don't know if I've ever shared with you guys that before I opened up my own sales consultancy, I worked for a company that was a sales training firm and Steve was one of the first people I met there. He was the lead trainer at the organization and I had the great good fortune to be sent out after my initial training to watch what Steve did uh, and how we, I was supposed to be doing my job for the next however long I was going to do it with them. And I can tell you this, that after watching Steve for about the first hour, my tongue was hanging out of my mouth. I was going, oh man, I can't wait to do this because this guy is brilliant at what he does. And it's truly my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, my co-author of two books, and truly my mentor, Steve Bookbinder. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Well, as I've said to you many times, thank you for everything that you've done for me because I, Every time I speak in front of an audience or whether it's through, through Zoom or face to face, you know, I hear your words coming out of my mouth. And I know you've many times said it's not true, but I still think it is. I I, I should probably giving you be giving you at least half of every paycheck I get. Not really, but <laughs> not really. But yeah, I, I, I owe so much to you. Uh, would you mind uh, just starting out, giving us a minute or two about your background, how you got into the sales training business and how you wound up at uh, your company, DM Training? OK. Um... So uh, I didn't get into sales training because I loved selling and wanted to share my secrets. It was like the opposite. I was an actor. I was a comic. I was doing improvisational acting. Uh, I got a chance to work with Robin Williams and some really talented comics and actors. And uh, during the that's what I did at night. And during the day, I was trying to avoid sales. So I worked at an ad agency where I was in a creative area very creative and no money. And uh, somewhere along the line, uh, my wife was very persuasive, not in sales, but very persuasive. She works in television and she used to have an office that overlooked the ad sales team's parking lot. And one day she called me from her office and she said, I'm looking out the window at the ad sales parking lot. I'm noticing how much nicer their cars are than ours. So you know what I'm thinking? Maybe you might want to think about sales. And so with that, sales. And I didn't know anything about sales, knew about acting. And I tried to imitate other salespeople. But, um, but what I learned uh, eventually was that uh, I wanted a job that put together me being on stage and me getting a commission. I didn't even think that such a job even existed. I followed a path that's described in the book, What Colors Your Parachute? And, um, uh, eventually figured out that there's such a job, it's called sales training. And so I, I, that's what, what got me into sales training in the beginning. My reasons for staying in it have changed over the years, but uh, that's what got me in it initially. But my version of sales training wasn't like most people where I would write a book and then, and then teach it. What I really did was I went around the world and I worked with companies and I helped them uh, improve their pipeline. But in order to understand how companies, how salespeople developed a good pipeline, I met some really smart, talented, clever salespeople. And when they would tell me about something that they did that worked for them, I would try to see if I can get it to work for me. And if it worked for them and it worked for me, that became the program. So my program today is, is really just 20 years of, bet, of collections of other people's best practices, all field tested. And, uh, uh, and so I really feel like I, I've just, I, I'm not smarter than the audience. I'm just, I've saved everybody the trouble of going around the world and talking to all these thousands of salespeople. So uh, I'm very happy when I can share a secret with somebody or share what really works. And also I've been with, I've worked with some clients so long, I've really got to see what really works over time and what really doesn't work over time. And uh, so I'm always updating my, uh, my act, if you will. And, uh, and I continue to do so. 
Wow. So first of all, I learned something new. I never, I, I knew you had about six years of professional stand-up comedy. And by the way, our guest next week is a professional stand-up comedian who also became a sales trainer. His name is Greg Kettner, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I never knew you worked with uh, Robin Williams. That's interesting. We're going to have to talk about that at some point. Uh, but I think you know that like you, um, I live for the audience. I, I love to be in, I, I love to help people and I certainly love to get paid for helping people, but it's great when we can impart knowledge or wisdom or experience uh, that gives them what they need to actually go out and make a better living and have a good time while doing it. And I know we both like to make people laugh. Um, Good morning to Gary Tejan's on the line. <laughs> good morning, yeah. Gary T. Uh, good morning, Lee Green, down at, also in Florida. Keith Ginsburg, hi to you. Jason Kaminsky, excellent to see you. Dennis Lombardi's watching us. Donna Levine, hello to everybody and thank you for joining. That's great. Um, can you tell me a little bit about competitive selling? What's the competitive sales system? Okay, well, I think there are two kinds of competition. And one of them is the, the oldest one of all. You're always trying to improve upon your own past behavior. And this is critical in sales because sales has an element to the job that no other job has. Every year, the sales goals go up and often the challenges increase. And sometimes the competition makes it harder and harder and harder to make more sales. So you have to make more and more sales and it's harder and harder. No other job gets this. They don't go to the accounting department and tell them they need a 10% improvement. They don't say to the receptionist, you need to be 8% friendlier next year. But salespeople are always doing that. And so when I ask salespeople, how are you gonna get better next year than this year? And I've literally trained 50,000 salespeople. So I've literally had an opportunity in more than 5,000 workshops to ask that question. How are you gonna do better? Everybody's gonna do better. How are you gonna do better? And everybody gives me the same answers, but the answers don't really, they, don't, they sound right enough. They go, well, I'll work harder, work smarter, be more productive. Well, probably you're working as hard as you can. And the goal is, what are you going to do? If you're working 10 hours a day, work 20 hours a day, that's ridiculous. Work smarter is my favorite answer, because if your whole plan is that next year, you're going to be smarter than this year, you know, I, I, you know you're in sales 10 years. You, how do you get smarter? What do you do? go to the smart machine and be more productive? We're already as productive as we can be. And if productivity tools is the answer, we're up to our eyeballs in the productivity tools. So I don't think that's the answer at all. So I think you always have to be better. And the way you get better is you improve these three things, word choice, time management, and what you measure, specifically your pipeline. So if you measure, I mean, you improve your word choice or time management and your what you measure your pipeline in that way, and only in that way could you improve upon yourself. But here's the other part. The customer is seeing more salespeople than ever. You, whatever you sell, whatever marketplace you're in, whatever product category you're in, you're not only selling against legacy competitors, peer competitors, the old, you know, the same competitors you always had, but you now have somebody from another country emailing in or you know, emailing in. So you're up against, and, and the customer is hearing from more salespeople. They're actually spending less and less of their time talking to salespeople. And we'll talk about that later, but they, um, they're, uh, they compare, it's not fair. They call it the halo effect. It's a psychological thing. The customer meets with you and then thinks about you and then thinks about all the other similar salespeople. And now they're comparing you, not just to you know what you said, it's to the 30 other people they talk to. So we have to be better than ourselves and we have to be better than the competitors who also want our customers and our prospects budget and attention. Mm, got it. Okay. So, uh, you know, one of the things I was most impressed with when I first met you and we started working together, uh, as you know, I, I think you remember, I had already had about 29 to 30 years of experience in, in, in sales and sales management. But what I really liked best was everything was real world. It, what, you know, so many books that I'm sure you've read and I've read and seminars I've attended. It's like, well, that all sounds great, but how do you really do it in the real world? It's like, I love the thought of the challenger sale, and I know we both consider ourselves challengers, but how do you really implement that in an organization in a, in a reasonable amount of time frame without spending a gazillion dollars? I don't see how you do it. And I really like that everything I've ever heard from you is like, oh, I, I think I can actually do that. I may not be able to do it as well as Steve, but I can do it. I love that real world thing. And you just brought up a subject that I didn't plan on asking you about today, but I think it's crucial. Um, I like to go around the room when I first uh, start talking to an audience and you know, let them introduce themselves to me. And I always, and I'm, 
I'm 99.9% sure I got this from you. I asked them what their biggest challenge is right now. And 50% of every room says time management. The other 50% just didn't think of it because it's their challenge too. Can you give any good tips about uh, time management? Because it's crucial. Sure. First of all, time is the only resource we have. And um, the single biggest reason that people don't accomplish their goals on a high level is time management. However, the words time management are so often used that I think the, the, the meaning has become lost. What many people think of as time management, they have confused. They've confused it with time monitoring, meaning that they're aware of how long things last. And so they think of it that way. So they think, well, the faster I do anything, the better I'm managing my time. The more things I do in a day, the better I'm managing my time. That's just not the case. Here's the thing with sales. There's always more to do than time. You have about, well, before the pandemic, I would have told you, you have about 200 work days, about 2000 work hours. For some of us, we're at home all the time. There's nothing else to do but work. And you know, you saved all that commuting time. So you know, in theory, you're working. I think you should also be taking breaks. So you know, even if you started at six o'clock in the morning, I think you should take an hour long break you know, at eight or nine or 10 or something like that. And you know, but, but whatever, you get about 2000 work. And um, so you don't have an infinite amount of time for all the things you could think. There's always more things you could do, you should do, than you have time. So the answer isn't, time management isn't about how do you uh, shoehorn every single thing into your day? No, as, as you add new things in, you gotta take some things out. So the governing principle should be this, a couple of governing principles. One, align your time with your goals. You know, Here's an example of something you and I did together. We wrote a book together by carving out time every week, or sometimes more than once a week, but certainly every week to work on our book. Now, how many people do we know that have a book in their mind? They go, oh, I want to, I've had a, I want to write a book, great. And I'll ask them, that's great. Did, did you write it yet? No. Did you write the draft yet? No. Did you spend any time at all this week, this month, this year on this book that you want to write? No. Well, if you don't put any time against it, you're never going to get there. So you got to align your time with your goal. I literally look at your calendar. Look at the, think about what's the most important goals, what are the most important professionally and personal thing, things to you. And look at your calendar to see, did you spend any time on that? Second, you go, well, I don't put everything into my calendar. That's the second mistake. If you want to get to something, you put it in your calendar. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to have a, a dentist drill a hole in my tooth. But you know what I do want to do? Get together with my friends. I don't schedule the friends, but I do schedule the dentist. The dentist is going to happen. We all know that schedule everything you want to get to. Not only schedule, but think about when you're putting it in, because each of us are better at doing different things at different times of the day, reading in the morning or writing in the afternoon. It's all personal. You got to know yourself. But also, because there's not enough time and there's a tendency to spend too much time on the wrong kinds of things, always uh, allocate the right number of minutes to every task you do. So if you're going to do something, don't even start it until you decide how many minutes you're going to work on it. I'm only talking about professional things. It's not personal things. You like doing something and it's fun and it's the weekend, fine, have, a, have at it. But if you're doing something like in sales, there's 27 things we've got to do every day, but not everything is equally important. Now, what becomes important? I'll tell you the best way to determine what's important. Think about a year from now. I call this the power of negative thinking. A lot of people talk about the power of positive thinking, no doubt, very good, but nothing, nothing beats the power. Next, here's what I mean. You have a goal to do something. You miss the goal. At the end of it, you think about it. For example, I'll give you a bunch of examples. You go on a sales meeting. After the meeting, an hour later, you're thinking about it. And you go, oh, you know what I should have said. You, you had a goal to lose weight or get in shape or learn a language or do, you know, learn a new skill. And you gave yourself a certain amount of time to get there. And now it's a week later. Guy oh, missed it. In sales, you had a goal to hit a certain number for the year, and now it's January 5th of the next year, and you're looking back on the previous year, you go, ah, you know, and as soon as you look back, you say to yourself, you know what I should have done? We are at our best, our most genius, our most insightful when we come up with, you know what I should have done? Unfortunately, we usually come up with it when it's too late. So what I do is I imagine the future. I say to myself, a year from now, what will I be disappointed in if I don't get to it? What will be the thing that a year and a week later, I'll say, you know what I should have done, but try to think of it now while there's still time to do it. So with that in mind, 
I want to build into every week a calendar appointment with myself to get to that long-term thing. And I'll give you an example. I'm working on a project right now called the Training Co-op where I'm going to bring to the marketplace training, online training from myself and a select group of other people, including you, Jeff. And I've got a whole scheme of how I want to do it. It's a long-term plan. It's got a lot of pieces. And right now, I really have to focus on short-term cash, closing the next deal. But I know that if I don't spend some time every week working on my long-term plans, I'll never get to them. So every week has got to have some short-term plan scheduled in and some amount of time on that long-term plan or it won't happen. Just one other thing about it. You know, in sales, often our time isn't our own. It's controlled by the customer or the prospect. You know, they missed the meeting or they moved the appointment or whatever. whatever. And it feels very much like the power's in somebody else's hands. And I find that to be um, uh, upsetting and frustrating. When you are building your appointment calendar, when you're putting stuff in and you're ma really managing your time, that's a very empowering thing. And I find that to, to just psychologically makes me feel in control of a world that I really have no control over. And in that way, it makes me psychologically and emotionally feel better. So managing your time isn't just about uh, multitasking. In fact, multitasking is often almost the worst possible thing you can do. Doing two things at once and screw up on it. Like, you know, even in a meeting, if you're talking and listening, you're going to screw up one of those. And then for salespeople, it's usually the listening part. So, uh, so, so uh, I've given you a couple of my tips right there in the uh, in managing uh, your time. No, that's absolutely perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Multitasking is a myth. <clears throat> you know, it's been proven scientifically that in the laboratory that your brain can only focus on one thing at any given nanosecond. And if you try to focus on more than one thing, they both suffer. So with my coaching clients, you know, I, I, I've transitioned less training, more coaching these days. With my coaching clients, I use two words, focus and velocity. Focus on one thing at a time. Focus on that most important thing like you're talking about. Let's focus on one thing at a time and then move on to the next thing and do it with velocity. I, I like to think of the old uh, carpenter adage, you know, measure twice, cut once. Right. Well, when you're working in sales, Certainly measure twice and cut once, but measure twice as quickly as you possibly can, and then cut as quickly as you can without slicing off your fingers. Because yeah. we only do, Jeff Schwartz, good morning, he said, we only get 24 hours in a day, and it's really all how we use them. And good morning to Ellen Volpe, uh, two greats here now. Hi, Ellen. And uh, you know, I, I don't think I've ever used this group to promote our books, and, I'm, and we're gonna talk about your new book, which is coming out soon. I'm very excited about that. But uh, in our book, uh, the uh, How to Be Your Own Coach, yeah. Zoom is a little confusing that way. Uh, it, it's a, a book, not just about setting goals, which there's a million books in. Um, it's also about how do you achieve those goals, which is what I think separates our book from so many. And, and the cool thing for me was, you know, we really based it on, as you know, uh, you, when you were training to swim the English Channel, uh, there was a lot that had to go into it. And, you know, Steve really came up with these great ways to train for the English Channel. My favorite part about that, by, by the way, was when you told me, you know, there's two things I really hate about swimming. Uh, you were a competitive swimmer, a college swimmer, uh, and uh, I've heard some great swimming stories and, uh, from you, but uh, you told me that you hate cold water and you hate jellyfish, both of which the English Channel are filled with. But, but we based the book on what Steve did to train for this thing that he really didn't love doing, but was committed to doing. Uh, one of the things I love best about what you said uh, in terms of time management is that thing about assigning the right amount of time. A and I often give the example, I use Google Calendar just because I like that one. I don't care which calendar somebody uses, but I have it set up to when I put in a new event or task, it defaults to an hour. So if I put in, I'm gonna write a proposal, it's gonna to default to an hour. Well, you know me pretty well, just like I know you. If it says an hour, I'm gonna find a way to fill up an hour with writing a proposal. But I've learned over time, if I'm focused and working as fast as I can without being sloppy, it only takes me 20 minutes. So if, we, if, we, if we're observant of ourselves and start to figure out how long do things really take me, and then we work with that focus, I think we're going to be way more effective at managing our time. Um, yeah. I, want to move to... I just want to add one more thing to that. Sure. You know, in a case like that, you know, in today's world, sales world, it's no longer about quantity. It is about quality. So if you're right, you know, you're not going to just call the next person. You're not going to win the day by having crappy proposals, but because you sent out a million of them, eventually somebody will buy. You probably have fewer proposals, so you really need a higher closing rate. So how do you make that work? 
And so let's talk about like, how do you get that, that proposal really done in an hour? What I've learned is you often can't do it in one contiguous 60 minute block. But what you can do is you can break it into two blocks. So every time I have something that involves uh, brainstorming or creativity, and I learned this from another trainer who, who influenced me, he said, always have two brainstorming sessions. So let, let's say the proposal, spend 15 minutes thinking about, okay, can I use a previous proposal as a template? What's the basic idea? Give it some thought. Okay, then stop, do something else. When you finally come back to it, you know, it's not how long you spend on something, it's how many different times you came back to it. Then you come back to it the second time, you've already given it some thought, maybe you put a starter proposal in, you know, in your files. So now you will, if you do it that way, you'll get it done. I'll give you one more example of this. Well, I'm, ter I'm, a, I'm not handy at all, but I do something that all, men almost never do, read the instructions. But what I've learned is it's a several step process. One, pour this much scotch into a glass. Two, drink it while reading the instructions. Three, let a, about a week go by and then build the thing. But because I've read the instructions, the instructions always have like step 17 is always something you wish you knew before you got started. So you got to read the whole thing and you got to relax, which is where the scotch comes in. But then when you're finally building it, you put it together faster. So you put the two, you know, the scotch instruction piece and the building together, I can get the whole thing done in an hour. But if I tried to do the whole thing in an hour, it would have taken four hours. We agree on so many things, Steve, but there is one thing we're disagreeing on here. I'm going to go with tequila while well, you're going to go with scotch, All but right. more yeah. scotch for you and more tequila for me. Okay. Um, there's something that you, uh, uh, before, I, I want to move on to another subject, but there's something you just said, which uh, I, 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 I know for a fact I learned this one from you. At one point you told me, I don't really write proposals anymore. My prospects write my proposals. Can, can you speak to that just a little bit? Because I think it's crucial. Yeah. A proposal, first of all, uh, you, it, there's a term called a strategic advantage. So if you look at game theory, it looks at how would you play a game and always give yourself a strategic advantage, like in tic-tac-toe going first would give you a strategic advantage. Well, in writing a proposal, I need to have a strategic advantage so that I can close at least 50% of my proposals because I cannot simply uh, write more proposals or generate more proposals. And so uh, because of that, I need to improve. So what is a proposal? Well, the proposal's got three parts. What you're selling, the offer, how much you're charging, the price, and when you're delivering it. So if you think of those as three separate sales, you could actually get the customer's input in it to it. Let me just give you the opposite of getting a customer's input. You give somebody a proposal which you hadn't actually discussed, which is how most people do. Most people, they talk to a customer, they go, we have the greatest product or service. The customer goes, really? Tell me about it. We, blah, 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 And then the customer goes, huh, wow, that's, can you get me a proposal? Sure, I'll get you a proposal. Then they spend all day on the proposal. Then they get it to the person and after killing themselves to write the proposal, weighing every single word carefully, customer doesn't read every word. They flip through it, they go to the back and they read the last line, you know, the price. So what I'd rather do is along the way, before I get to the proposal, before I actually get, oh, one other thing. Before you get to a proposal, it's easy to get to the customer. You could always be gaining more information. You could always be asking more questions. You could run another demo past them or talk to other decision makers. But once you get them the proposal, there's no other thing to talk about. Hey, I got your proposal a month ago. Any questions? No, if I had a question, I'd have called you. That's a good point. So you know, you're really out of, out of things to do. So what I recognize is the more they like me, the more they'll buy the proposal or they'll look at it generously. The more time I spend with them before I submit the proposal, the more chances for a relationship building. So use that time to ask them uh, a couple of questions about the proposal they're eventually going to see. And the way I do it is with an outline. I, I say to them after the first meeting, instead of saying, let me come back with a proposal, I go, you know what, I'm not really sure. Let me come back with an outline a one page discussion document and the middle of that document, the main part of that document, is here's my assumptions about what you're trying to do. And here are my recommendations based on my assumptions. Well, the interesting psychological thing is when you tell somebody a week later, what you heard them say and say, you know, when we met last week and you told me that my assumption is you're looking to do this, that, and the other thing. They, well, they'll either confirm it, they go, yep, that's exactly what I said, or more likely they'll go, no, that's not exactly right. 
like, well, in that conversation, if you go from that to the recommendations, then they're going to change. If, if the assumptions are wrong, the recommendations have to change and they have to be involved in helping you rethink how you write them. Guess what? Those recommendations, that's what's going to be in the proposal. So I'm basically getting them to double check what I was thinking of putting in the proposal before I put it in. The other thing is with price. I think that if you are showing a customer proposal and you've never talked about the price and you're surprising them in the proposal, then you shouldn't be surprised when they go, oh, oh, we'll get back to you. I think what you got is, and they'll never get back. So I think it's important it, uh, somewhere along the way to say, listen, if I came to you with a perfect proposal, exactly right, but it was $25,000, how do you think you'd react? Suppose they go, what, Tw 25, ah! Killing me. Well, I think I'd want to know that reaction before I got to it. Some people think, yeah, but if I really, really, really wow them with value, they'll just be so brainwashed, they barely notice the price. That on planet Earth, that doesn't happen like that. They, you have to run the price. You got to get a reaction because they got to go, oh, 25. Well, why? Is, well, you see, my budget's only 20. Oh, okay, maybe you'll adjust or you'll keep the 25, but you go, oh, who, who could approve it? Well, I got to get to my, well, why don't we strategize to get to the boss and get that person's information before we write the proposal? So the process of writing the proposal together leads you through all the other meetings, the information gathering, the relationship building. By the time you write a proposal, they should be looking through it going, yep, that's what we talked about. Yep, that's what we talked about. Oh, that's the price we talked about. Got it, got it, got it. Got it. And by the way, if, Along the way, you determine, you know what, the price would never work or the offering would never be a fit or they would never implement it soon. If you really determine that, then you'd stop the process before you became annoying. You wouldn't get them a proposal and you'd save yourself all that time writing a proposal, which was destined to not close, which is another way that I increase my odds of closing because I only show proposals when I've already determined that they're going to buy. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a proposal machine. I'm not in the proposal business. And one of the things I love is putting the prospect's words in the proposal so that they hear themselves when they're going over it. Because when you and I say it, well, we're scumbag salespeople trying to take their money. But when they say it, of course, it's true. And, and by the way, I have to tell you, you know, speaking to you right now reinforces one of the reasons I love you so much, because I've been in front of audiences more than once where they go, could you please slow down a little bit? We can't understand you. Listening to you, I go, I'm actually pretty slow sometimes. Oh, this is one of the yeah. <laughs> oh, and uh, Ellen says she doesn't always have insp inspired thoughts uh, and needs to wait for them to come. Scotch, hadn't thought of that. And Jeff Schwartz, good morning, Jeff, says, uh, make sure it's single malt. Yes, I learned that from my good friend, Gary Tejan, who was my first sales manager. And I learned a lot about selling from him. And uh, uh, But the Scotch was just one of the many things I learned. Another thing, by the way, I learned from him that is you know, underappreciated. There's a lot of things in sales that involve doing, making the right move. And you got to think about it. It's only in a movie that people go from one brilliant line to the next brilliant decision to the next. You actually have to, you know, uh, break up your day so that you're working alternately on something you really got to think about and something you got to, you know, be high energy about and some administrative task. but you've got to build in that break. And, and for salespeople, we process information by talking. So you're actually better off pulling a boss or a coworker aside and say, you know, I'm thinking of having a meeting and asking this question or asking about this. Or what do you think? What objection do you think I should be ready for? You talk it out with a salesperson. You're so much better than if you just think of it in your own head. Yeah. And as we've discussed in our book, I'm not here to promote that, but uh, there, there's also a right time of the day for each person to do everything. And it's not the same for you necessarily as it is for me. People need to really monitor and get aware of when their mind and their body are more uh, awake and less awake. Like for example, I'm a morning person. I fall out of bed, raring to go. I don't drink coffee at all. Uh, I, I can't even imagine myself on caffeine. Uh, well, you you know me a long time, you know, I wake up, I do a, smoke a little crack and, you know, uh, drink some uh, tequila and gets the day going. Right. But, but by three o'clock in the afternoon, I fade badly unless I'm in front of an audience. So for me, the smart time to do things that take more brain power first thing in the morning, leave the easier stuff for later in the afternoon. Um, Wow, I've got 75 more questions. We're already halfway through and I absolutely want to get to the book, but I don't know. What, I want to cover two topics before we get to the book. The, the first one is, uh, and you brought it up, how do we judge where we should be investing our time? Can you talk just a little bit about pipeline management? Sure. There are three parts of pipeline management. 
and pipeline management is a terrible name for the uh, man, the thing you manage. It sounds like a plumbing course. Yeah, how to how to manage your plumbing. The first thing is when I ask people this question, it's a question that only is obvious after they hear me ask it. But I want you to ask if you're a salesperson on this on the listening to this conversation. I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to look at your own pipeline. And before you make a judgment about how good it is or bad it is, too much stuff, not enough stuff, and before you get lost in, oh, I'm so glad I looked at it because I'm reminded, I forgot about that ABC company and that XYZ company. Um, I want you to look at it from this point of view. What is the pipeline supposed to look like? In other words, what would it look like if everything was on track, which is a whole different kind of question. Because what, what that really says is the very first thing you got to do is you got to think about your goals. You got to think about what is the company's expectations of you? What's your own expectations? Reverse engineer the way the finances work so you could figure out what sales you would need to close in order for you to hit your personal goals and, and, be, uh, and to do that. So that's the first thing you got to do. Second thing you got to do is you got to say, of course, I'm not going to close everybody. So given that the reality is some people will not buy, I got to know my own ratios and I got to be realistic about this. But I also have to say, if I want X result every month, what literally what would my pipeline have to look like every month? And if you could create a real pipeline that matches the so-called ideal pipeline, you could write a check against your pipeline. Most people could not write a check against their pipeline because what they do with their pipeline is they they find an excuse to put everybody they can in the pipeline and they never take anything out well that's not smart and that's not managing your pipeline that and that doesn't fool anybody you can't call customers and go hey i know you're not interested but guess what i just did to you i put you in my pipeline at 90 percent so that means you're gonna have to buy sorry i mean that doesn't work if that worked i put my whole lead list at 90 percent so, uh, so first have an ideal pipeline and adjust that as your knowledge of your own ratios um, uh, get, get sharp. Second thing you got to do is you got to find a way to inspect. Inspect and take things out. Most people don't take things out. And I don't mean stop working on it. I mean, just stop counting on it. So take it out of your forecast. But you got to ask objective questions. And I'll give you an example of an objective question. Somebody says to me, I've got a 90% prospect. Really? When will you have the contract in your hand? I'm listening for your answer. If your answer begins with Tuesday, Tuesday, I'll have the contract, this end of this week. Good, solid, rock solid. If you start your answer with the word, well, it's over already. When will you have the cut? Well, well is the beginning of a very long story that with a very sad and unfortunate ending. And when, you know, here's another one. Uh, you submit a proposal. Here's the big question. When will you get a decision? Not when will they buy, not when will you implement, not what do you think they're going to say, when, you, because the knowledge of when, if they're going to make a decision soon, it's more likely going to be a yes. If they're not going to make a decision soon, then the decision that they'll ultimately render will probably sound like this. You know, we've decided to not decide. We've decided to hold off on making a decision. So, you know, it's like everybody, nobody wants to make a decision. Everybody will make a decision when their back is against the wall. And they won't make a decision before. So unless there's a compelling reason to make a decision by a certain date, you won't. So when you learn the answer to when will you make a decision, which you can only learn from the customer, then you're also learning in that process what their decision uh, trigger point would be. And then uh, here's the big one. Here's the huge one. And it's the most obvious one, but people don't want to believe it. What's the objective of each step of the meeting to see if they'll see you again? If they won't even see you again after the first meeting, what are the odds they're going to send you a check or send you a signed contract? Obviously not as good. You know, and it's the same thing when you're dating. If you have what you thought was a good first date, and at the end of the date, you said, hey, listen, I had a great time. Love to see you again. If they give you an answer, like, how's Friday? Let's get together Friday. We'll get together again Friday. If they give you an answer other than yes, it probably wasn't a good date. We know that when it comes to dating, we have to think about in that same way.
way that that's how human relationships work. If the other person isn't willing to put some time against that second meeting, then they just don't think it's valuable enough for whatever reason. And so uh, if my pipeline, only, so I got to have these inspection questions that are objective in the way I said, tailored to your business. And now everything that doesn't pass muster, we got to remove from our forecast. So after you remove the stuff from your forecast, what's left? Does it match your ideal pipeline or not? And then finally, just the fact that you move something out, the goal isn't just to feel bad, go, Ooh, I was counting on something, but now that I asked myself this tough question, I got to take it out. And now I got to shoot myself in the head because I'm so depressed. So now it's like, well, okay. So now the game is how do I strategize to get it back? What do I need to get it back in place? I need the date. I need a piece of information. Usually I need a next step or a piece of information about when they're going to do something. So, uh, so how can I make a strategy that's going to yield that answer? How can I get them on the phone or get them to answer that question or get them to introduce me to somebody? So that strategizing, which you should do with your team is the key thing. So pipeline management is really aligning your goals with your pipeline, ideal pipeline, coming up with inspection standards that you can as a team all agree on and all use that same grid of questions. And then finally strategize everything that keeps falling out and, and in that way, you'll keep moving things back in. Yeah, H having a great pipeline management system and somebody to inspect it with you, whether it's a trainer or a coach or, or their manager, uh, keeps you honest. Because I, I, I think you'll agree, you know, we salespeople, not not those salespeople, you and me and everybody else, we tend to lie to ourselves. We want to think we have way more going on than we do because it makes us feel good. But when we really don't, we're hurting ourselves. Yeah. And we also, as salespeople, tend to think every prospect is equal which they're of course not. And you have to have a way of judging, where should I be investing my time? And a good pipeline management system does that. And I, I could not agree more with you about, you, you've, gotta, you've gotta know what the goal is and reverse engineer. It always boils down to how many first meetings do I need? How many first appointments do I need at all time? Because if you know your metrics and you know how many, what your closing ratio is, what your average dollar volume per sale is and all that other stuff, you can actually achieve any goal but not if you're not being honest with yourself. And, and speaking of honest, our friend uh, and your first manager, Gary Teachin, just said, who's in the same time zone as us, by the way, I just poured my first glass of scotch. Gary T, you're the man. <laughs> um, before we get to the book, I, I, I'd like to, if you could spend three or four, maybe five minutes, because I want to leave enough time for your new book, Echo Selling. Um, God, I've got 74 more questions now. It, it, the pandemic certainly changed things a lot. And I think, I, I hope you'll agree that it all starts with getting an appointment. It, pandemic, non-pandemic, if you can't get yourself in front of people, no matter whether it's on a Zoom call like this or the telephone or face-to-face, -face, you're screwed. And my experience is that most sales organizations and most salespeople are simply not speaking to enough prospects and enough of the right prospects, but let's not worry about the right prospects. Any advice on prospecting today? Yeah. Um... I knew you would have something. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm in the business of having advice on questions like that. So, you know, like a lot of things, um, it starts with a benchmark. It starts with some kind of an expectation. Uh, usually people, you know, the way they talk about prospecting really tells you how they work about prospecting. Most people say, well, I prospect every free moment I've got. Oh, really? How many free moments do you have? Well, none. Well, then I guess you didn't prospect. You know, you should be writing proposals every free moment you've got is more of it. So um, here's uh, what I find that it works. First of all, the word prospecting is like a lot of things. Everything has changed over the years. If you're still doing anything the same now as you were doing it in 2015, it's probably wrong because everybody does everything different. In fact, since March, the world has changed. You can even argue since September has changed. So however you did things prior to March of this year, is interesting and in historically, you know, perspective. You know how they used to ride horses in the 1700s. Uh, you know, remember how I used to prospect before the internet? Doesn't matter how you used to do something. It only matters how it works today. So that's an important thing. And um, uh, more salespeople are at home writing more emails, making more phone calls, making it harder than ever to get your prospect's attention. So, given all that, um, here's some of the things I think you you might want to think about. Start with a benchmark. And that benchmark should be, I want to talk to a new person, ideally once a day, at minimum once a week, but track how many new people that you never talked to before 
are you talking to? Or if you're an account manager, by the way, you could apply that if you're an account manager, new people within an existing account, or, or if you have a different kind of a territory, new things to talk about with your existing contact. So if I always talk to my existing contact about our day-to-day -day operation, my servicing your, you know, the service of my product and service right now, can I come up with another product, another service to talk to you about, or some internal other department that could possibly use my service? So, um, you know, find that, but set that benchmark first. So that's the first thing. Second of all, it should go in this order, social, email, uh, phone. Social email phone gives you an opportunity to do personal marketing and social selling, by the way, most it's like a, you know, people misunderstand it. They think, let me send an email with what would have been an email that I would have sent to a thousand people. Mistake. You got to think about social media like a cocktail party. You walk into um, a cocktail party, you wouldn't walk over to a total stranger and say, hey, Jeff, I'm Steve Bookbinder. Hey, what kind of insurance do you have? Like, you wouldn't do that at a party. But that's what people do on social media. Hi, I don't know who you are, but let me give you this big sales pitch. Right off the bat, you're uh, uh, turning the other person off. So, uh, and one just logistical thing about like LinkedIn, for example, most of us are on LinkedIn among the social media, is um, if the other person is not recently engaged with you, they also won't see your posts. So there's a whole, so you got to engage with people. So there's, there's a whole strategy of social media and social selling. And by the way, social selling is social is not just Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. It's also a blog. It's also a newsletter. So all of that should be part of your strategy and content should be part of your strategy and personalization should be part of your strategy. Because one thing that we've learned from digital media that we can apply to sales is everything is relevant if it's what the customer was thinking about right now. But what's the customer thinking about right now? Buying from you? Not likely. In fact, most customers are either at the top of the funnel. This is what market is like, top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. Bottom of the funnel is you're ready to buy now. So if I'm ready to buy a car this week, I'm at the bottom of the funnel. In the car business, they call that an auto and tender. Everybody on this call is qualified to buy a car. It's the most common thing we're all qualified to do. Yet, only 2% of any marketplace is going to buy a car this week. And everybody else in the middle of the funnel, which is thinking about the next car they're going to buy, or the top of the funnel, qualified but not thinking about the car. So given that you're qualified but not thinking about it, what content could I share with you that would bring value, that would be relevant? Because if it was relevant to whatever it is you are thinking about, then you will it'll catch your eye. So social, followed by email, followed by phone call, and you've got to have a cadence of these things. So we can't reach people once and think that that's it, nor can you call somebody every single day for a year, and that won't work. So what's the right cadence and spacing between the calls? And this notion of cadence is best aided by a technology. But uh, if you do, all, so it's a process. It isn't just always say these words, always turn around that objection and you're good to go. Always start with how do I get people to talk to me in a world where they're not, they're statistically not likely to read any email or talk to me. Uh, uh, so let me work on that. Let me work on, all, you know, they say it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. And it's not even who knows you, it's how did they know you. So how can you work on getting somebody to refer you to somebody else? So the prospecting process, you eventually want a certain number of meetings, but it starts off with a whole bunch of social selling with a lot of pieces of that strategy and email marketing with, with waves of emails and A-B testing of different subject lines and opening lines and finally phone calls. And there, when you finally get somebody on the phone, if they have an objection, you better be able to turn it around. And, uh, and studying which cadence works. And yeah. so it's a big process. It, it's, it's really the main thing that salespeople do, but I will give you this incentive. In every sale, in every single sale, and I've worked with people in every kind of sale, the most lucrative skill you'll ever have is appointment making. And the better you are at appointment making, the less you have to be pushy which is crucial in today's world. You can't look salesy. You can't be strong arming. The turning around objections is not as good as not having an objection to deal with. Finding somebody who's actually interested in talking to you. So the more you prospect, the less uphill selling you're going to have. Yeah, that's great. One of the greatest pieces of advice you ever gave me, and I, I doubt you remember this, but um, we, we worked together at a company uh, that was owned by a guy who 
wrote at the time what was the Bible of cold calling. <clears throat> and we were best known for being a company that trained cold calling, except you know very well. And anybody who knows me knows I hate cold calling. I love teaching it, hate doing it with a passion because calls just don't go the way I want them. Hey, Jeff, let me just send you a check. You're terrific. Don't worry about even getting the appointment or coming out here, but that's not the way calls go. And you said to me, look, you got to do something to get appointments. If you hate cold calling, what do you love? And I remember responding to you, said, I love speaking in front of people. And you said, then go book speeches, book them for free, talk to groups, because some of the people are going to be interested in what you've got. I, I remember that to this day. We've only got uh, about 15 minutes left, and I want to get to your book, because uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about that. And I, I'm excited. Anything that you're writing, I want to read. So can you talk a little bit about echo selling? What is that? What does that mean? How does that help salespeople? Take sure. it away, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, we started to address a problem just now, which is that you send a lot of emails and in mails and you post stuff, and it's hard to get people's attention. And customers are simultaneously being inundated from messaging from salespeople. Those salespeople are sometimes using technology, so they're really amping up the quantity of emails. So people that used to get 50 emails are getting 150, 100 of them from some salesperson trying to sell them something. So there's the problem. And statistically, customers are spending little less and less time talking to um, salespeople. But let's add one more thing to this, that customers, B2B customers, the studies show, are now buying like consumers, meaning that they are in a buying process. They're at the top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. They're in the buying process and they're 50 to 75% of the way through the buying process before they talk to the first salesperson. Hmm, so what does this mean? That means that customers are talking amongst themselves. They are thinking what's their problem, what's their pain points, what's their challenges. What's changing in their world? What could they do to gain an advantage, to stay in business, to stay alive? So they are thinking about their pain points, their challenges, the problems they're trying to solve, um, but they're talking to themselves, their sphere of influencers. I think of it as a circle of influence. And that circle has two kinds of people in it. One, they're actual peers and coworkers, people that they see in meetings when they have their monthly and weekly meetings, and also the thought leaders that they follow on social media. Just like you and I won't go to a restaurant or remember going to a restaurant. We won't go buy something until we look at reviews in that same way. The B2B buyer is looking at the thought leaders of their business who write uh, newsletters and blogs, et cetera. Okay, so how do we be effective in such a world? What we have to do is we have to think about the ZMOT, the zero moment of truth. And that's this moment. I send, I'm a salesperson. I have something to sell to Jeff Goldberg. I send you that email. Let's say I break through the clutter, get your attention. What do you do next? If you did anything at all, you'll tell coworkers, you know, I'm thinking about calling Steve Bookbinder. If the coworkers look at you and go, who, what? I wouldn't talk to him. That's the end of the deal. You'll never get back to me. I won't know why you didn't get back to me. I'll think maybe I didn't use the right word. Maybe I didn't send it on the right day. Maybe I didn't have the right cadence. Meanwhile, I failed this test. I, the, I, I was not in the room when you were having this conversation. On the other hand, when you, when I finally get to you with a sales pitch, I have to not only convince you, and I'm putting air quotes around the word, but I've got to get you to echo my pitch to your coworkers so that when they hear it, they go, ah, oh, that's good. So I need your coworkers to echo my pitch to you to give you the validation that I'm worth talking to. And I need you to echo my pitch to them so that they uh, give you that uh, reassurance that it's safe to move forward. Well, this nature of echoing, how do I get to the circle of influence? It means I have to find who they are. I have to figure out who is in that circle, how to communicate to them so that if and when there's ever a conversation that involves something irrelevant to the service I provide, my name will come up in a, in a room. I can't be in the room. My name will come up in the room. I'll give you an example of this. I had an old client that I hadn't talked to in a long time. And there was one particular person I really wanted to talk to, but I wanted him to call me. So I spent a month strategizing, figuring out who does this person talk to internally? Who are their coworkers, their peers? Who, what are the, who are the people who own the problem that he would probably be trying to solve? 
And I got to all of them through a variety of social selling, posting, it was all strategy, uh, blog posting on the thought leaders that they look at, just anticipating the moment that if my name came up in a meeting, they go, oh, yeah, Steve Bookbinder, we ought to give him a shot. I was targeting one guy with a goal of getting that guy to call me. I use the principles I talk about in my book, Echo Selling, and three and a half weeks later, that guy called me to ask me for a quote on something. Absolutely got it to work. So this isn't just a theory that I have. I know from every study that you can't get to customers, and yet the customers are being influenced by someone. They already have a thought. They have a bias. They have an opinion. We've got to get to them when they're forming that opinion. How do we get to them? How do we get them to echo our pitch? How do we, you know, people in sales meetings, they answer questions to customers like, well, what, what do you guys do? What makes you better? What makes you different? But they don't give an answer that the customer can echo to their team, to their boss, to the rest of the team. And as a result, there's no echoing and there's no reassurance. And that's when you, you were waiting for them to get back to you. You were waiting for them to um, uh, confirm that next step. That's why they're not getting back because there was no echo. So the echo is what's happening in the room that we're not in. So this book is the concept. I'm going to explain how, I, how to demonstrate this for yourself, the tactics and the strategies so that you could find the people who are the circle of influences around the customer that you're targeting, how you could get them and your customer to echo your pitch to each other, which is how you're going to get them to move forward with your sale. Brilliant. Really? So, so 15 or 20 years ago, where we might have been able to pick up the phone and get right through to them in today's very crowded headspace that uh, everybody has because so much is going on. We're so bombarded. You have to influence the people around them and get them to reach out to you. I love that. It, it seems to me that would also be very uh, useful in a sale where you can't get to the final decision maker and somebody else has to do the selling uphill for you. Is that correct? It, it, in fact, it's, it's, it, yes, absolutely. But here's the crazy thing. We've all been taught qualified to find the right person, the decision maker. So everybody goes in, are you the right person? Are you the decision? Maker? Are you sure you're the decision? Maker? Are you sure you're the right person? And no matter how you do it, the person goes, yep, me, me, me. Then you give them the proposal. And almost 100% of the time they go, thanks, I got to go to my boss. And you're, and you're thinking, what do you mean, God, you? I just asked you a million times if you were the right person. The moment you give somebody a proposal, there's somebody else that you'll never determine who that is. Can I meet with the boss too? No, no, you no, no, nobody gets to, I've, I've been here 10 years and I've never met the boss and you're not going to meet them first. And nobody so, meets the great and powerful yeah, odds. It's, it's, right, it's always the Wizard of Oz somewhere else in the York. So I don't, you know what, when, when somebody says I got to talk to my boss, you know what, I, I don't ask, uh, can I go to? I ask, are you going to recommend me to your boss? Because actually that's more important than if I'm going to be there. Presumably that person has a relationship with their boss and I don't. So I want that process of echoing to happen. What are you going to tell your boss? What do you think your boss will wonder about? What will they ask about? What will you say in response to that? Let me help you. Let me give you the words to say. Let me give you a way to echo my pitch to them. So yeah, there's always going to be a decision maker. And by the way, the decision maker isn't always a boss. It could be the team. It could be that you're talking to the CEO, but they're not going to make a decision unless they talk to their team that works for them, but they want the team to be on board. So the echoing is throughout the organization. You got to get the whole organization talking about you, you to get a sale. Fantastic. Uh, in, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you how we can uh, get the book. But uh, since we have a couple of minutes left before we have to end, I, I do have some more questions for you then. Um, what is sales improv? Is that using comedy and selling? Uh, well, when I actually did improv, I had to follow a lot of rules. So actual professional improv, um, you follow a lot of rules, but you make it up as you go along, but you follow these rules. And why do you follow rules? Because professional improv isn't just simply you get paid for it. It means that the paying audience has to find it funny every single performance. You can't say, I know tonight's not funny, but two weeks ago, we did a killer show. You should have been, it's gotta be funny every single time. So if you follow the rules, it will always be funny. And if you don't follow the rules, it won't be funny. The difference between that and selling though is this, I have to make my meetings sound improvised. But in fact, I actually know how the meeting is gonna go because it's gonna go the way I begin. If I always think about the way I'm gonna start, I can anticipate the way they're gonna respond. If I think about my first question and the kind of answer they may give to a first question, let me also consider in advance what the 
follow-up clarifying question will be, what their answer is likely to be, and what the clarifying question will be to them. So I could conduct the meeting as if I'd never thought about it before, like it's just off the top of my head. But in fact, if I do it that way, statistically, I'll have a crappy meeting. And I'll walk away going, oh, you know what I should have said. So I need to anticipate everything that could possibly happen and how I'm controlling what they say by the way I ask, by the questions I ask, by the starting point, by the next step I suggest, but, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the more I think about it, the more relaxed I'll be, the more I'll see the flow, the more I'll see that they're actually doing the things I anticipated them doing. And even if they do get, throw a curveball at me, the more I rehearse, the more ready I'm going to be. So we have to sound improvised without actually being improvised. Hmm. So if I'm hearing you right, Steve, I'm actually supposed to think about this stuff before I go to a first meeting and not just walk in and wing it. If you're a character in a movie, you wing it and a brill brilliance comes out of your mouth. But uh, that only happens in a movie. In real life, that doesn't happen. And, you know, most people want to madmen their meeting. So they want to go in and go, how about this idea? And they want the customer just like a madman to go, whoa, br you're better off getting this reaction. Great question. Great question. My goal in a, the first three minutes of a meeting is to ask a question that they say, that's a great question. You're, if, you, if you could just prepare just that, that alone will give you a 50% edge over all the other meetings. It will improve by 50%. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things here. Wow, that's a great question. Most people don't ask that. And, and is that what you're talking about when, when you say that, uh, that that's how you um, prepare for a first meeting? and, uh, and well, let, let me ask another way, because we've got about three minutes left. What, what kind of due diligence do salespeople need to do before the sales actually the sale actually starts? A handful of things. One thing, decide on the starting point. Now, the starting point may have two starting points. You might say, you know, how are you doing dealing with COVID? So that's sort of like, I always go with like, before we begin, how, you know, just uh, how you're dealing, you're working, you go about how you're feeling, you're all right. But then what's your, how are you going to open it? Well, let me tell you about me. Or, you know, or, or do you know anything about us? Or you know, So literally, what's that open? The second thing is you're probably going to be asked to summarize your company in a little elevator pitch. Make sure you rehearse that and you tailor it, personalize it to the kind of person that you're talking to. So have the opening line before you begin, the actual substantive opening line, the way you're going to do your elevator pitch, your first question, what's that most important? Yeah, that's a great question. Also, Think about in advance a similar customer. What's a customer that we have worked with successfully that's like this one? What was their problem? What did we do for them? Have that story in your back pocket so that you could say, you know, we work with a company like yours. You know what their problem was? You know what we did for them? So you want to be able to roll up that story. And then finally, since everybody's getting a call from a million salespeople, you better be uh, ready to answer this question. So how are you different? Hey, are you guys just like... Aren't you just going like, and you want to be able to say, well, actually, there's four differences between them and us and be able to roll out those differences. So if you have the differences, the success story, the question, the opening line and your elevator pitch, you're, I mean, there's many other steps. Uh, I teach a whole course on how to prepare, but those steps alone are the most missing steps and most crucial steps, preparation steps. So kind of like a Boy Scout, you better be prepared. Steve, we've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to share my screen now. Would you please uh, just tell people how they can get the book? It's not ready to buy yet, is it? No. So I'm working with a company called Publishizer, and we are in a pre-order campaign. And the way it works is the more people pre-order, the better publishing company I'll get. And as a res my goal is to get the word to a million sales. My goal is to tell people that selling has changed. Being a hard-nosed salesperson, being the, that famously, you know, uh, uh, cliche extrovert salesperson is no longer the way to sell because the buyer is different. We need to adjust to the new world of buyers. So I'm trying to get to a million people. The better publishing company I have, the better I can do this. So I'm asking people to go to this link here. You'll register for the publishizer and you'll see my book as well as every other book that's being, you know, in the process of, 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 uh, of being uh, uh, written right now. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pre-order the book and I've created incentives. So if you buy one book, I'm going to give you access, free access to one of my online programs. If you buy three books, you get a different deal. You got five books, you get a different deal. Buy 50 books, you get a different deal. So you, what you're going to see is I'm rewarding you. I'm giving you something in exchange for the pre-order. So um, 
just today, I created a new course recently called uh, Great First Impressions. Just today, I got a free order from somebody, and that was the bonus gift, if you will, that they chose. So go there, pick the book, pre-order. Re- you got to register for the site, pre-order, and you'll get something in return uh, of, of great value. And you'll be helping me get the book to the right publisher, and you'll be helping me get the word out to as many salespeople as possible, and you'll be helping yourself learn the secrets of Echo Sound. Sounds good. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Uh, I'm now sharing your contact information. Would you just tell people briefly, what is it that you do? Why would they be interested in working with you? And how do they contact you if they are interested? We are a sales training company. We, uh, we uh, do uh, sales training and digital media education. We've got social handles on our left. We've got a uh, Finally Friday is our free, did I say free? Free newsletter on the right. Um, uh, so I encourage you to go to our website, sign up for it. It's not just my articles and videos, but we find other articles, other people's studies, everything that you need to learn. You just didn't have the time to learn. You probably didn't have the time to go to the Harvard Business Review. We do. If there's something on emotional intelligence that was interesting for salespeople, we put it in. Funny cartoon, you need a laugh. We put that in there too. Also go to our website. You'll see access to our free playbooks. And we have a podcast. It's on all podcast platforms. It's free also, and you'll have access to the playbooks, the podcast, uh, register for the uh, Finally Friday, follow us on our social handles. And that's my email address. I'm always working. So if there's ever, if I talked about anything today or you have a particular question I can help you with, I am happy to help. My uh, goal is to help as many salespeople as I can. Uh, And in that way, I share Jeff Goldberg's uh, um, uh, mission in life. And by the way, for those of you, as, as Jeff has been very generous in his praise to me, but when I'm in trouble, when I need a coach, Jeff is my go-to guy. So uh, please know uh, that he is the man. Thank you for saying that, Stephen. I'm always honored when I get a call and say, and it sounds like, Jeff, I'm in Dubai and I need a dose of Jeff. That's one of my favorite things. Steve Bookbinder, uh, you're the brother I never really had. You've taught me so much. You truly changed my life. I love you truly. And uh, thank you so much for generously sharing your time and your advice with everybody today. <clears throat> and I'll end as I always do. Sales is a game of making things happen. Get out there today and go make sales happen. Bye, Steve. So Bye, long, everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a great one.